Welcome to Conversations Live. This is our second event of the 24-25 season. Tonight, we're one-on-one -on -one with John Rustad, the leader of the Conservative Party of British Columbia. We come to you from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations, who have lived on and continue to call these lands home, OCM. Conversations Live is a long form public affairs dialogue series that seeks to advance our understanding of the big issues of our times. We also strive to draw attention to organizations that make a difference in our province. And tonight I want to introduce you to Martin McNish, who is related to me, he is my son, along with Spencer Whalen and Janine uh, Romano of Give a Damn. Now Give a Damn is a group of 100 plus friends who get together about four times a year, and at each event, they support three local charities. So that's per event. Uh, added up, it's about 12 charities a year, depending on how many the events they hold. To date, they have raised more than $250,000 that they've been able to donate to micro charities. Give a Damn's next event is in the spring, and you can find out more details on Give a Damn Vancouver's website. Now, before we begin, for anyone who wishes to pose a question, please go to slido.com, enter the passcode Conversations Live, and send in your question. And Sean, our Slido master over here, will be receiving your questions and bringing them forward to us. Now, we won't be able to get to them all because already it's starting to uh, stack up. But those questions, and I can see them here, they help to inform me about topics and questions that we're going to bring up with Mr. Rustad. <coughs> And also joining us from Victoria is Vancouver Sun legislative reporter Alec Lazenby. Now, to set the stage, we've been asking Mario Canseco to run a series of polls while we're running this series. Uh, Mario, uh, we will see you up on the screen here momentarily. Over to you. Soji Inclusive Education raises awareness of and welcomes students of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and family structures. Across BC, almost half of residents support the use of SOGI inclusive education, while just over a third disagree and 16% are undecided. BC residents aged 18 to 34 are more likely to favor this policy than their older counterparts. We find significant consensus when we ask BC residents about the recently implemented ban on the use of mobile phones during instructional time in K-12 classrooms. More than three in four BC residents believe this was the right decision, including more than nine in 10 residents age 55 and over. When BC residents analyze specific energy sources, sizable majorities come out in favor of wind, hydropower, geothermal, and natural gas. Fewer than half feel the same way about biomass, oil, and nuclear, while coal is at the bottom of the list, garnering favorable views from fewer than three in 10 BC residents. Almost three in five BC residents are in favor of expanding the development of the LNG industry. Almost half think now is the time to explore the possibility of relying on small modular nuclear reactors for electricity generation. Just over two in five BC residents would forbid the use of natural gas in new buildings. For many BC residents, the solution to the rising concerns about public safety are best dealt with in the legislature. More than four in five would like to see harsher penalties for individuals convicted of multiple offenses, and more than three in four would bring in new regulations that will allow for asset confiscation in the event of drug offense convictions. Support is equally high for increasing police presence in areas where drugs are being sold illegally. BC residents are very supportive of specific ideas that could help mitigate the opioid crisis in the province. Almost two thirds would like to implement a system that would allow people charged with minor offenses to avoid fines and jail time if they voluntarily go into rehabilitation. Support is higher for both ensuring that housing units are provided to individuals committed to recovery and investing in new and enhanced facilities for mental health care. For Conversations Live, I'm Mario Canseco from ResearchCo. Thank you, Mario. Now, I have one last uh, short video that I put together about you uh, so that we can give everybody a little bit of uh, your background before we launch into questions. RF, can you run that video, please? Born in Prince George, John Rustad has spent his life in central BC. 
Prior to entering politics, he worked in the forest sector where he founded and ran Western Geographic Information Systems. In the year 2000, I thought this province was just going so sideways under the NDP. I sat down with my wife and said, what do you think about moving to Alberta? And we had a long talk. I mean, obviously I was running the company at the time and my whole family was in Prince George, her parents were in Prince George, and I had a number of other business interests. <clears throat> so we decided to stay in BC. Well, that left me with two choices. Do I um, uh, just live with it or try to change it? And that ultimately led me into politics. He was elected the MLA for Prince George Omanika, a riding that has since been dissolved. So since 09, John has been the representative for Nishako Lakes. He retained his seat in the 2013 election and was appointed Minister of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation by Premier Christy Clark. He kept his cabinet post following his re-election in 2017 and added the role of Minister of Forests, Lands and Natural Resources, operations to his duties. He was re-elected in 2020 and served as the Liberals critic for Forests, Lands and Natural Resources operations. Well, in opposition, John was asked unceremoniously to leave the Liberal caucus. But ultimately what ended up happening is the federal government put out a paper called the Farm Emissions Reduction Strategy, which talked about reducing or eliminating the use of nitrogen-based fertilizer and stopping cows from farting and belching because somehow that was going to change the weather. And you know, I thought of thinking about it, first of all, this is going to have a pretty negative impact on my riding because 35% of my riding is agriculture-based. But 40% of the world's food supply comes from using nitrogen-based fertilizer. So we're talking about significantly reducing food production, which of course would drive up prices. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense. So I tried to have this conversation within the BC Liberals at the time, BC United, of course, now. Um, and they were sort of kept putting it off and refused to have this conversation. So in August, I decided to just put out a retweet uh, of a, of a, of a um, Patrick Moore tweet, which sort of questioned the role of CO2. Anyway, this created all the fuss. Uh, ultimately, I had a conversation with Kevin Falcon and he, he asked me to take it down. He said, you're not allowed to do this. And I said, look, Kevin, I've been trying to have this conversation. It's an important conversation for my riding. Um, and he said, nope, you have to parrot our party lines or you can't be part of our caucus. So I said, okay. So that's when I explored, started exploring what the path would be and ultimately led me to joining the Conservative Party of British Columbia. At first, he sat as an independent MLA until February of 2023, when he joined the Conservative Party of BC, giving it a seat, one single seat in the legislature. As of September that year, the party acquired another MLA who crossed the floor, which meant the party was now given official status. Today, there are five Conservative MLAs. We're in a crisis in just about everything you look at in this province, and people really want change. They want that common sense change in British Columbia, and I think that's what we've tapped into. There you are, John. On October 19th, uh, when the votes are tallied up, what do you envision is going to be your role in the governance of this province? Well, first of all, uh, I'm glad to be able to be here and have this conversation. I think it's it's great opportunity to uh, answer a whole bunch of questions that I know people have uh, and to have this uh, broader conversation. So on October 19th, uh, I am hoping that the people of British Columbia will instill on us the honor of forming a government. It'll be the first time since 1927, almost 100 years ago, that a conservative government will be formed in British Columbia. And so uh, if we have that honor, uh, there is a tremendous amount of work because quite frankly, the workload only doubles once you get to that point in terms of what actually needs to be done to be able to improve lives for people in British Columbia and bring about common sense change. Well, you've got a significant uh, undertaking ahead of you just in pulling together uh, what is in essence, even though it's a party with a hundred year history, it's a nascent uh, party. Uh, you have to pull in all that infrastructure uh, to run that system. Uh, how are you doing on that? Well, things are coming along nicely. I mean, now we have, uh, what is it? I think seven MLAs or eight, eight M seven? Sorry, <laughs> can't even remember now. Seven MLAs, I think it is, yes. Uh, in terms of it, I, I, I think more about the fact that we now have 93 candidates running for us that we uh, have announced just this past weekend. And so uh, certainly the infrastructure is coming along in terms of a party and the structure that we need to do. Uh, but really what we need to rely on is grassroots movement because that is what has led us to this success to date and we need to continue with that. 
We did some polling not long ago and it said that 56% of British Columbia is looking for that common sense change. And so that gives me great hope that we have not topped out yet, that we have lots of opportunity. And as we start rolling out more and more of our policies, I think there's that going to be that potential uh, to continue to be able to be successful and gain support. And, you know, should we have that honor, like I say, form government? Well, you sh certainly are uh, making a difference and uh, rattling some cages. I turn on the TV all the time and there you are in one ad after another, after another, after another. They're not ads that you're paying for, but you're in all of them, and you're being painted as not a very nice guy. Are you? <laughs> you know, I, I do have to chuck a little bit about the NDP and, and their approach and these advertisings that they're doing. And, and even, it, it seems to be like, you know, I'm more prominent in their platform and stuff than they are, quite frankly, and that's all very interesting. Uh, but unfortunately, the reality is there is so many lies that are being said, the stuff that is just not true. And, you know, I was crossing the bridge the other day. Um, it was the uh, Iron Workers Memorial on the way into Surrey for a number of events that we were doing there. And I saw a big billboard and it said, you know, the Conservatives are going to bring back tolls. Well, that's just not true. It's just an outright lie by the NDP. Same with, you know, we're going to cut health care spending. It's another outright lie. We're going to bring back MSP. No, we're not. Like, that's, these are just outright lies. And I look at it and I think, you know, it's actually pretty flattering to think that this is what a leader of the province has come to is outright lies and misinformation. I don't think it's quite frankly what people in this province are looking for. But when you look at that and you just say, okay, so clearly, you know, they can't defend their own policies and not running on anything that they're doing. As a matter of fact, on several policies are actually running against their government record. But, uh, you know, I, I take a lot of solace in that, thinking that as the Conservative Party, we really are bringing about that change that to the point where that's the approach that these guys are taking for their entire campaign. Well, in some of those ads, I get the feeling that you were uh, uh, maybe the de facto premier in previous governments because according to the ads, you're responsible for everything that happened in the past. Oh, yeah, I, I know. Actually, I really chuckle at that. And I, I often think, boy, I guess... I guess, you know, David Evie must be wrong in 1927, the last time Conservatives formed a government. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. I didn't mean to distract you. <laughs> one issue, of course, that has been put out there, and I think that is one that many people have concerns about, is what's your approach towards uh, the funding within the healthcare system. Um, you know, we, especially when it comes to hospitals, uh, employ a global uh, budgeting system for the hospitals, which is a model that, as I understand, has been, um, I guess, uh, left off the table by most OECD countries over the past and gone more to activity based uh, funding. Is that the shift that you're trying to make? And then how does their math add up if that's what you're proposing? Well, first of all, um, they just pulled that number out of the air. I mean, there was a report that showed the cost per capita in British Columbia versus the other nations, and they somehow figured that was where the number came from uh, in terms of what they're talking about in a reduction of health care. The reality is in British Columbia, we have the second most expensive health care system in the OECD nations, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and we have the second worst in terms of the many, many measures. Most measures right, put us as the second worst. So you look at that and you think, okay, we should not be proud of a system that has ER closures, that has 10, 12-hour waits in ERs, that quite frankly, we're having to send patients outside of the province. Like people, almost as many people are dying in British Columbia today from waiting for diagnostic services and surgeries as they are dying from the opioid crisis. And so you look at this and you think, we need dramatic change. And so I, I say, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Let's look at these models that are doing much better. The European style models that are universal health care, just like our health care. They're a single payer, government pays, but they're delivered by both government and non-government agencies. And it allows for innovation, it allows for better investment, it allows for better utilization of our healthcare professionals, it allows for us to be able to have a better opportunity to both retain and attract new healthcare professionals, and allows us to make sure that we are focused the, the money on the patients, not the system. And by doing that, um, we can actually do a lot better with our healthcare system. But it just takes the courage to say what's, what we're doing is broken, 
and we need to look at change. Can you explain the difference between global budgeting and activity-based budgeting? Sure. So, for example, if you have a hospital that has a billion-dollar budget and they're struggling to meet their budget, what they do is they close beds because they look at patients as a cost. Whereas on an activity base or, or funding following the patient, if you have a hospital that's struggling to meet its budget, it's actually going to be looking at how you expand services because it wants to generate more revenue. It needs to have more, uh, more patients being seen and looked after. And so what that does is it also means that it creates those opportunities for innovation because you know, people come along, whether it's new technologies or whether it's you know, more efficient ways of being able to do, to do the services that are needed, um, government you know, isn't looking at it from a particular lens. They're just looking to purchase the service to make sure that patients receive the care that they need to be able to get on and, and to recover. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Alec Lazenby, who's joining us from Victoria. Alec, uh, what's your first question here for Mr. Rustad? Hi, John. So my first question for you tonight is about your comments that you've made in the past about not whipping votes if you were to form government after the next election. You've talked repeatedly about wanting candidates and MLAs to represent their riding first and the party second, but it looks like this is going to be a close election if the polling is accurate. How would you handle whipped votes in a legislature where, you know, you might only have a three or four or five seat majority? So that's a very good question. Um, and what I can say about it is, I think it's very important that MLAs are elected to represent the riding and not represent the party to a riding. And so that means that we're going to have to have the opportunity for MLAs to be able to speak up and to be able to vote on behalf of their ridings. And so that will obviously create some challenges. And as we look forward to bringing our platform forward in terms of actually implementing, should, like I say, should we have that on our form of government, uh, there will be things that we'll have to work through. There'll be issues that we might have to have, you know, long conversations in caucus about how we work this thing through. And if there isn't the support for it within our party, then we probably won't bring it forward. But it's okay to have people kind of stand up and actually vote against their own government on issues. Because if it's important for them, if it's important for their riding, you know, I think we should have room for that. And the BC Liberal Party used to have that. Matter of fact, I voted against my government on a number of issues when I was elected. Because I think, you know, very strongly that democracy needs to be protected. Democracy, you know, is a very fragile thing. And if you are telling people, sorry, uh, if you can't vote for us, you have to leave the building, which is what we've seen in for both the other parties, both NDP and NBC Liberals, which of course is not running at the moment. Uh, I think that's wrong. Right? People should be able to, they're elected to represent the writing, they should be able to go in and make those decisions and be able to speak their mind and vote accordingly. Alec, do you have a follow-up question based on John's answer? Yes, I guess my question is, we see a lot of independence and a lot of, uh, you know, the Greens are still around. It could be um, a, another minority situation. I know lightning doesn't usually strike twice, but it could here um, after 2017 and now in 2024. Just wondering, you know, on confidence votes, uh, like, would you, would you whip um, your caucus and sort of, you know, what's, What's going on there? You talked about democracy, but at the end of the day, you need to keep uh, the government functioning. So you're absolutely right. There are confidence votes that are necessary. They're, they're very few within government, uh, but there are confidence votes. And so uh, we would work through the issues that we would need to within our caucus and then try to make sure that we have those votes that we need to be able to move forward. With regards to whether or not, you know, we're in another 2017, a minority government situation, um, the reality is, in British Columbia, I think there's been four or five people that have been elected as independents since 1905. And so the odds of an independent getting elected and holding a balance of power is extremely low. It may happen. You never know. I mean, in terms of how politics can go and what, where the people are. But I think, quite frankly, in the more likely is that we're going to be back to more traditional type model of, of democracy in British Columbia. And my hope is that it's the Conservative Party that will be able to bring about that common sense change needed in BC. So we have a, quite a number of questions coming in from viewers and people here in the audience. Sean, can you go to question number two there? I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, sure, the one the, uh, from the oil and gas worker. Yeah. yeah. So a question from uh, Prabhjot Singh. I'm an oil and gas worker considering moving to Alberta because I pay over half my income to the government. Would you consider changing the top tax rate to keep, B, uh, to keep BC, help me keep more money in my pocket? 
So at this particular point, we are not looking at making any changes to where the brakes land in terms of the top tax rate and the various barriers and the various uh, uh, thresholds, I should say, on taxation. However, we are looking at significant tax reduction, both in removing the carbon tax as well as other taxation measures that we would want to implement to make, make it more affordable for people to live in British Columbia. And in the next week or so, we're going to be introducing a lot of those tax measures. Um, so please stay tuned with regards to that. That's a perfect segue to move into environment, especially carbon tax. Uh, tell us exactly where you're at on carbon tax. Is it your plan to just eliminate it, or do you envision maybe moving back to it? Uh, what was the original intent, which was to help motivate people to come up with different forms of transportation, but not to be hurt financially? Could we uh, find a... Um, an alternative such as that, or are you steadfastly committed to saying no? The the tax goes. You know the the challenge when the, when the carbon tax was first brought in, it was revenue neutral, and there was significant tax breaks, both personal tax breaks as well as uh, corporate tax breaks, and also uh, homeowners uh, grants were increased. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of the or homeowner tax breaks were increased, particularly in terms of northern residents. And that was actually a very interesting model that came in place. It quickly started degrading after that. Um, you know, it started getting to be, uh, we would actually add things like the film tax credit and say this is part of the carbon tax. And it was, it was a way that ultimately ended up just becoming a money generator for government. And I get it. Governments need money and they look at any source they can. The NDP couldn't resist. Now, of course, they've just completely turned it into just a revenue generator for government. Uh, I look at the carbon tax from this perspective. It impacts everything that we do in our society. It's not just what you pay at the pump. It's in the groceries. It is in construction. It is in the clothing that you buy. It is in everything that you do in our society. And I look at it from a perspective of, has it achieved what the goal was? When the goal was first brought in, the goal was to reduce the people, to reduce the percentage of, of hydrocarbons that were being used um, so that we had alternatives. And the reality is it hasn't changed. We have the highest taxes in the country on gas, certainly probably in North America, and it hasn't changed the per capita use of, of fossil fuels, of hydrocarbons in British Columbia in compared to the rest of the country. So you look at it and think, okay, it's not achieving what it was meant to do. It's become a revenue generator for government. And quite frankly, we've got a premier who believes that taxing people into poverty can somehow change the weather. So this has got to come to an end. So the Conservative government will bring an end to this. We've heard recently, of course, the NDP now flipping on their policy and saying that they will reduce the carbon tax as well for consumers. But then they're going to significantly increase it on the business side. And as we all know, that's just a tax that will get passed on to the consumer that's now hidden because you don't pay it up front, but you're paying it you know, through price increases from, from, the, from the business side. So that's their approach, and I think it's wrong. As a conservative government, we will remove the carbon tax from British Columbia. Uh, it is unfair, particularly for, for people in this province. It's, it's unfair in terms of our competitiveness. So I, I just can't be any more clear. It will be gone under a conservative government. So part of the response to that is, uh, well, John Rustad doesn't care about the environment. Um, how could he be a, a climate denier? Uh, what is your commitment, uh, especially when we look at the impact on the environment through forestry and mining and transportation and ocean-going vessels and so on? Where do you stand in our commitment? Because we have to be fair here. We do have good environmental standards in so many aspects of our life. Is your move towards eliminating the tax indicative of what your commitment is to the environment in all other areas? Certainly not. From my perspective, we have some of the best standards in terms of environmental management anywhere in the world uh, here in British Columbia. And we want to maintain those. We want to make sure that we are leaders in terms of how we manage the environment. But when I look at it, I also want to make sure that people can put food on the table. One in two people are thinking about leaving this province. One in three people are thinking about, or one in two youth, I should say, are thinking about leaving. One in three people are thinking about leaving this province. And that means we have to do everything we can to be focused on creating the opportunity in this province for people to be able to have a future, to be able to stay in this province, to be able to afford to buy a house, to be able to raise a family, to be able to make sure they can just do the basics of putting food and, uh, and pay the rent, right? And so 
that's where we're going to be focused in, in terms of this, as opposed to trying to drive some sort of ideology that ultimately is hollowing out, you know, both the economy in our province as well as people's desire to be able to live here. Well, that's quite a perfect segue to the next topic that I want to bring up, and that is the cost of living in British Columbia. I went and I looked up figures going back to about 2019. Uh, the average family of four in the province of British Columbia was earning about $99,000. They're at about a 28% tax rate, which means that they were taking home mm, $60,000, basically. Uh, and since then, their annual salary has increased $2,000 over the last four plus years. Only $2,000. The cost of living has increased more than 20 percent. They're underwater. What can we do to address this very real problem? I mean, you pointed out the fact that one in three are considering leaving uh, and, you know, young people in particular are going, I can't afford to live here. You know, that's, that to me is the measure of a government success. People ask me as a Conservative Party, you know, if you have that honor of forming government, how would you measure your success? And I would say, that in four years from now, one and two youth are now looking at staying in this province and building a future here. That to me means that we have been successful in what we're doing as a, as a government. And so that means we have to tackle head on affordability. And that's affordability, you know, I think it's grocery prices just in the last two or three years have gone up 23%. Um, you know, so that's just why people are struggling. You know, half the population um, are you know, needing to think about food bank and just struggling just to put food on the table. It's no wonder why people want to leave. So we can only do so much in terms of bringing down the cost structure, um, you know, food, and we're going to be doing that uh, in terms of this. We've got to bring down the tax structure, which we're going to do in terms of the carbon tax and other tax measures we're going to put in place. We're going to deal with the, the big issue, which is making sure that the supply for housing, particularly for rental units, so that we can stabilize our housing prices. But ultimately, we need to be able to get our economy growing. We need to make sure that companies can be successful so that they can pay higher wages because that's where you have to deal with it. You, there's only so much you can do on the tax stuff. There's only so much you can do on the construction, on the housing side. We need to be able to see higher wages in this province. And higher wages do not come when you have zero growth per capita in this province, which is what we've basically seen as well. It's, it's slightly above zero, but it's, you know, it's basically been that, and it's projected to be that for the next 40 years. We cannot afford to be like that. We have to be able to get our economy going. We have to make sure companies have the confidence to invest in this province so that we can drive wage increases in BC. Alec, I can see out of the corner of my eye, you're chomping at the bit there. You've got another question for Mr. Rustad. Over to you. <coughs> Yes, on Indigenous rights, you were obviously Indigenous Re Aboriginal Relations Minister, but I just wanted to ask, you've talked a lot about economic reconciliation. You said that you would rip up uh, DRIPA. You've also said that you wouldn't go the path that the NDP are on in terms of the Land Act and giving Indigenous nations shared decision-making on the land base. But what, what does all of that mean? What would you do in regards to Indigenous rights? How would you work with Indigenous nations? And are we headed back to the courts on uh, things like Indigenous title? Well, I would suggest to you that to look at the courts today, there's already court cases going forward on Indigenous title uh, in terms of that in BC. Having said that, uh, look, uh, my perspective on working with First Nations is that you need to be able to have what's called economic reconciliation. You need to be able to make sure First Nations can improve the quality of life, can engage fully in the economy. And I think it was Dr. Joseph Gosnell who was the... Uh, uh, you know, the, the architect in many ways of the Nishka Treaty, which was the first modern day treaty in BC. And his whole purpose of doing this is, in, and he said, was that First Nations have been held back economically for decades and decades. And it's high time they have the opportunity to not only catch up, but if possible, surpass. I want to bring life to that type of agreement and that approach. I want First Nations to be able to engage fully in the economy, to be able to be successful, to move from managing poverty to managing success. And the only way you can do that is to have that focus on the economy and increasing economic activity. Because reconciliation can't be about giving, taking from one person to give to another. It has to be about adding economic opportunity. It has to be about making sure that there's a potential for that growth so that both Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike can prosper. That's where we need to go. And the, 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 what's happening today 
is it's uh, the process that the government's put in place is creating friction people to people. It's working government to government, but it's creating friction people to people, and that to me is not reconciliation. That will end poorly. And so I want to get to a place where we look at returning land to First Nations strategically to open up these economic opportunities, where we're honoring Section 35 of the Constitution, which is Indigenous rights, including title, but that we aren't overburdening ourselves with with these burdens and processes that this government has put in place. So DRIPA, uh, UNDRIP will remain with this government. We will use it uh, as a tool to be able to engage and, and to guide how we work with First Nations, but the legislation itself has become problematic, and so anything that's, that's problematic and creating those frictions uh, shouldn't be kept in our society. You do embrace the, the fact, though, that we absolutely do need to have these strong economic bonds between First Nations and uh, the rest of the economy, and that a failure to do so limits people within those communities, and it, and it uh, deprives all of us of what the economic benefit can be when everybody thrives. You know, it certainly does, and so I look at it, this is a critical piece, and, and when I had the honor of being minister, um, the business community came to uh, Christy and uh, Christy Clark at the time and said, "You need to triple John's budget, because this is this is something that has to be done. What we're doing, the agreements that we're signing, the advances we're making, is opening up this potential, and we need to do more of it. And we need to do it faster to be able to unleash the potential in BC." And so, you know, we kept on building in, in terms of that. And I, there was a report. I think I can't remember which of the accountant firms that did it way back about uh, 20 years ago that said if the question of land and title could be addressed, it would unleash 14 billion in economic activity overnight in British Columbia. Well, I would suggest today that if we were to do that same study and analysis, and if we can address title, if we can go down this path, it would probably unleash somewhere between three and 400 billion in economic potential within British Columbia. And so that's where we need to be able to go to if we want to be able to see the success in, in that we have to have in terms of growing our economy and resolving some of these significant uh, social issues that we have in today by that growth. We have a question here on Silo that's going to take us into a, a whole other area that has been a hot topic lately, housing. Sean? Uh, Thanks, too. I do not like the NDP housing mandate, which is ruining small communities and favoring developers. Would you stop this and bring back single-family-only zones? Uh, that's a very good question, um, and I think, um, I, I look, I support democracy. Democracy is fragile. Democracy is something that we should celebrate, and quite frankly, we need to get more people engaged municipally in terms of democracy, but that's a different question. The reality is what NDP have done is they actually have said, we don't care about local democracy. We are going to say that the government knows what's best, and we're just going to implement it. And I don't believe that's the approach we should be taking. It's a very authoritarian approach uh, by, quite frankly, um, a, a hardcore socialist government. My perspective is we actually need to work with communities to change the um, uh, official community plans to do pre-zoning for densification so that communities or the, the uh, uh, municipal governments go through the process of engaging with communities. They make the decisions about where that additional density should happen within the communities. They then can plan for traffic and for water and sewer and all these other things that need to be happening. Um, and also, you know, if somebody wants to come in and build a duplex or build, you know, an apartment building, they know where the zoning is. They can come in and deal with it and it should be a relatively simple process. So I'm not in favor of the approach that the government has taken, uh, particularly on you know these idea of building you know fourplexes in communities. There's no plan for parking. There's no plan for water and sewer. There's no plan for traffic. There's no plan for anything else that is needed in terms of how, you know the frustrations that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. Where I would look at though is what government has done, and I would want to do this once again by working with communities, and that is densification around transit. Because as you're building out major transit within the province, we do need to be able to have the opportunity to see significant densification around those corridors. Uh, however, like I say, I think it should be working closely with government to do this, as opposed to the local government that is, as opposed to having uh, it just the provincial government overriding this. In a recent episode of uh, Carol Taylor's journal, she pointed out uh, when addressing the housing uh, situation, housing affordability, um, that there have been more than 60 announcements over the last 18 months, all focused on making housing affordable. 
and it's still unaffordable. Where do we go from here to make it affordable? <laughs> boy, oh boy, uh, that's a, a very interesting question to have. Look, when you get a BC housing project that's completed that says a 395 square foot home can be, uh, you can rent, uh, pay, pay your monthly rent on for $2,700 a month, uh, that's not affordable, no. and I'm sorry. And that's just ridiculous in terms of what government has done and seems to think of what is affordable. We need to significantly unleash the private sector's potential. And David Eby actually once said that the private sector doesn't have a role in housing, it should be government. And I'm sorry, this is not the Soviet Union, right? We need to be able to unleash the potential of the private sector to be able to invest. And what I mean by private sector is I'm not talking just about big business or large developers. If somebody wants to be able to build a duplex or if somebody wants to maybe invest in a second home, you know, as a way to maybe generate some revenue for retirement and create some rental housing, they should have those opportunities too. But the cost of doing business, 30, close to 30%, if not even higher, the cost of a new home is government and government taxes. The new building code, for example, that's being put in place is adding between 30 and $80,000 to the cost of a new home. And government is saying they're focused on affordability. How is it that they can't see that they are driving up the costs of homes and affordability with their policies and approaches? So this is the things that need to change within our government. You know, I recently did an interview with uh, fellow Ernest Lang who uh, put forward the Singapore model uh, where a significant portion of the land in Singapore is owned by the government and they build housing that they ensure is going to be affordable for everyone else. And 20% of uh, the land is for free market and that you can build anything you want and charge what are market rates. Do you have any appetite to entertain that kind of model and could it bring some stability, recognizing that it would take a long time to implement that, that kind of shift here? You know, I think um, uh, I'm interested in looking at any kind of model, quite frankly, that's going to be able to address and stabilize our housing prices because like, you cannot bring down dramatically housing prices. If you do, you're going to sewer your economy. You're going to create so many problems, quite frankly, that um, it'll make the housing crisis look simple. And so you can't do that. What we need to do is we need to have that stability of housing construction and availability to create, um, to create uh, sort of a... a, a static housing prices, if you want to call it, to stop this significant increase in housing prices, at least for a period of time while wages catch up and, and tax measures can be put in place so that affordability can catch up to the actual cost of housing. So these are things that we need to do. We need to significantly increase rental and we're going to be rolling out a lot of plans around our housing policy in terms of how we can do those types of measures. But the reality is, you know, I also believe very strongly in private property rights. And so to do the model that they're doing Singapore would mean government would have to basically buy back a lot of property or change or take away people's private property rights. So that to me is a no-no, I won't go there. Uh, there may be some other kind of projects we can look at. We do actually need to make more land available for housing because going up is not necessarily the solution for being able to create stability. You actually need to be able to uh, expand out. So we have to be careful. Of course, we've got to protect our, our agricultural land and those sort of things. But these are all types of things that we need to be looking at uh, in order creating stability. But So the Singapore model is interesting, but you're also talking about a very small, confined area uh, by you know one small country that's in there. It's, it's a very different model and doesn't necessarily translate to other areas like British Columbia. Uh, Sean, maybe you could uh, share question number two from uh, one of our viewers here because it takes us into another land use issue. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, a simple question. Uh, where do the Conservatives stand on the ALR? Simple question, and for a simple answer, I suppose, not quite so simple, but so ALR is this. ALR was created, I think, in 1973, um, 72, 73, and it significantly impacted on private property rights, and in return, government provided a benefit for people giving up those rights. And they significantly impact those rights to say, we need this land to be available for growing food in the province of British Columbia. So what's happened over time is those rights have still been taken away. The agricultural benefit or opportunity to grow food is still there, but the benefit that came from government has reduced to practically nothing compared to the rights that have been lost. So I actually want to look at how can we renew our commitment to the ALR 
from government in terms of um, the, uh, in terms of how we compensate for those rights being taken away. But more importantly, we need to look at how we double food production in BC. We only procure 34% of the food we consume from this province. Two thirds of the food comes from outside of our country. And that leaves us vulnerable. And I don't think we should be leaving our population vulnerable as a province. I think we should look at how we can expand food production. But we're the highest cost producers of food. And as the highest cost producers, we need to figure out how we dramatically drive down those costs so that we can see that significant increase in food production to be able to look after our own populations in BC. And what we can do in terms of the commitment to landowners from the LR is part of how we can drive down those costs and make sure that you know, we're meeting those needs within a province. I will say one more thing about the LR though, and that is there are some lands in the LR that shouldn't be there. They're either isolated lands or they're rocky soils. They cannot be producing the food that I think we'd want to do. And so I certainly will be looking at those kind of examples from a perspective of, does it make sense for this to be in the LR? Uh, and if it doesn't, can it be used for other purposes that we need to have uh, within our society? But all of that has to be in the context of how we look at doubling our food production in this province and making sure we're looking after our needs uh, and the needs of the people. You anticipated my next question, which was about underutilized uh, agricultural land. There's a significant portion of it, especially in the Fraser Valley. It's underutilized, but it's not allowed to be used for food processing. And food processors here in British Columbia can't compete even on industrial lands. Can you see a shift uh, that would be relatively easy to be able to make to to make that available, those lands available to food processors, so that they compete, produce the food that we grow here, rather than sending it to Washington State to be processed? Yeah. So what you're what you're talking about is actually the Agricultural Land Commission and the rules then that follow that. Uh, so not to be confused with the Agricultural Land Reserve. And so we have these rules in place that says if you want to process berries. Um, you can put in a plant, but 50% of what you process has to come off your own land, which then means it limits how much you can process in terms of that, in terms of the products, to only having 50% more that comes in. And so what that does is it means that you're going to have small and inefficient processing plants as opposed to making, more, making the processing more centralized and more efficient and more cost effective. And so we do need to look at the LC rules around that in terms of how we do these sort of things uh, within the agricultural sector, but at the same time making sure it's all part of increasing agriculture production. And the other interesting thing I look at is, is we've got rules in place that says, so if you're a farmer, to get farm status, which gives you the little bit of benefit that you get on taxation, uh, you have to produce agriculture products, and it's got a whole list of agriculture products. But, you know, get this. So if you produce berries, you can, be a, you can get farm status if you can reach over the certain threshold. If you want to take those berries and make jam, and sell the jam as a product, it's not considered an agriculture product. And so we're actually having a disincentive to do value added to our agriculture sector in BC through the rules that are in place. So these are the kinds of things that we need to look at changing. I don't want to leave Alec just uh, alone out there in Victoria. I know you're in a room all by yourself, Alec, and you've got other questions that you want to uh, uh, direct to Mr. Rustad. Over to you. Yes, uh, John, another thing that I'm wondering about is you just put out your forestry policy, but a lot of your platform has yet to be released. I know you're waiting for the start of the RIP period, but does that leave you open to the NDP sort of defining who you are and who your party is, especially around more socially conservative issues? You've talked about Soji in the past. They've tried to uh, say that you're going to change uh, the availability of contraceptives, which you said you won't do. But in terms of putting out policies on those issues, is it maybe a good idea to put out policies earlier in order to stop your opponents from defining you? So actually, you know, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and politics is an art, it's not a science in terms of how you do things. Uh, we actually looked at actually releasing policy last spring. Uh, and then we'd end up always having something that was distracting, particularly with the United Party and this process we went through that took away opportunities to be able to release information. Uh, all of the disastrous things that were happening with the NDP and their policies that were just you know, compounding in terms of you know, what's going on with, with safe supply and drugs and all these other types of things that they were wearing. So the window just kept not being there to release policies. And then as you get into the summer, 
you know, we released the one major policy in terms of healthcare, because that's obviously one of the top issues that we need to be able to address in BC. But when we looked at it, we also thought, okay, this is during summer, there's not a lot of people paying attention, we got all this other movement going on. And then, of course, then we had the BC United decide that they were going to fold their tent, which I really thank Kevin Falcon for, you know, coming in and endorsing us and, and suspending their campaign. That took away from our ability to do policy. So now here we are, four days from the election. And so we're looking at it in terms of when do we put policy out, right? And so we actually have a schedule now in terms of the major policy pieces that we're going to be announcing, uh, the, the, the process of getting that out there, making sure that people are aware of what we're doing. It's going to be very exciting as we get into the election and roll out uh, you know, policies almost every day as we're going through this and leading up to the various debates that we're going to have in October and ultimately for people making those decisions in advance polls and, and on the final day in October 19th. I believe you're already on the record as saying that you would eliminate stumpage. Why? Yeah, so the stumpage system is archaic. Um, it is a front-end tax. Um, it is not responsive to market conditions, and it's become a barrier in terms of actually being able to do forestry in British Columbia. By itself, it's not the only problem. There's huge other problems in forestry. We're the highest cost producers. There's tons of layers of bureaucracy. It could take three years to get just a simple cutting permit. <coughs> Nobody has the confidence to invest in BC. We're the highest cost producers anywhere in North America, if not the world. So there's lots of changes that are needed, but one piece of that is their stumpage model. Instead of having the tax up front, what we're going to do is we're going to create a value added uh, end product tax on the backside. And by doing that, it allows us actually to uh, give incentives to do more with the fiber. So instead of it being just about the saw log, we're going to be creating a um, a fiber annual level cut instead of saw logs. And so we're going to, the more you can do with the fiber, the more input credits you can create, the more value you can create from that product, it'll create more input credits. So it creates the incentive to actually do more investment and creation within our, within our forest sector. It's only a couple parts of what we need to do to be able to make sure our forest sector can get its feet back underneath it and put people back to work. But I think it's an important piece, an important symbol certainly for the sector to show that we are serious about making sure that we have a healthy forest sector in BC while managing the important things about diversity and other values that we have on our landscape. Forestry is important, but uh, we see a, a resurgent mining sector in British Columbia, and there is a tremendous focus on what mining in British Columbia can do to help us meet our green energy objectives. But it's a sector that is bogged down in process that says, yes, here's the resource that we have. Here's our target for when we need those resources. But the uh, environmental and regulatory process means that we're not going to actually get to being able to produce the products that we need until after they're needed. How do we address uh, shortening that permitting process and still protect the environment? So here's an interesting problem that is out there in British Columbia. We have today 17 mines that are either permitted or about to be permitted. And in addition, I think we've got another five precious metal mines that are in the same state. Those 17 mines represent a $38 billion investment. They represent creating between 20 and 30,000 jobs with an average wage and benefit of 138,000 a year. And over the life of those mines, we'll add 800 billion to British Columbia's GDP. We look at it from this way that the NDP's approach is they've got a plan that's to, creating a, to create a strategic uh, critical mineral strategy that will then will drive plans that will eventually get to a place where a, first, a mine could go forward if there's agreement with the First Nation. All of that bureaucracy and process needs to be taken out. We are not going to be changing the environmental standards, but we need to be able to remove all those layers of bureaucracy and process. So a big part of this is going to be a single project, a single permit. It's a big piece of how you move forward with doing these things. By doing that, it's, it's, if you had to move forward, for example, on a mine expansion like in Daco back many years ago now, um, it required 12, 11 permits under three different acts and took several years to do. How is it that they could potentially get 10 of those permits but the 11th one would bring it a stop? It doesn't make any sense. It needs to all be done at the same time in terms of a process that you put forward through and strip out those layers of bureaucracy and time and costs so that you can actually get to your result much faster. But you also need to make sure that you have the ability to do certainty in this province uh, so that when you are going to make the decision to put a billion dollars into the ground, 
there's the ease, there's the expectation that you're going to have a reasonable payback period, and we're going to be able to see those wages be able to uh, materialize and expand in British Columbia. So we're going to have a very heavy focus on mining at certain as a province because it's one of the ways that we can get our economy up and going to pay for the improvements we need for health care and for dealing with addictions and, and all the rest of those kinds of things within British Columbia. Plus, as you're right, we need these minerals. Right? If we wanted to be able to do the significant expansion of electricity, electrical production and transmission, you need to be able to have these minerals. So it's going to be a big focus for us as a Conservative government. I was at a resources uh, breakfast this morning uh, focused on mining and heard the uh, northwest part of the province uh, being described as a, a new term that I can't give attribution to the author of it yet because I don't know who it is, but uh, referred to the area as the Copper Corridor, that there is a, a, a wealth of copper there. To be able to mine that out though, and uh, we need to have infrastructure and investment, and we are already in an infrastructure deficit. What role does the province uh, play in being able to help these uh, heavy industries uh, to realize what this economic potential might be. You know, the Northwest used to be called the the Golden Triangle, and now it's the Copper Corridor. <laughs> so who knows what that'll be labeled at, but it's absolutely true. There is tremendous potential for resources, and that those potentials go right through the whole province. It's not just in the Northwest. But infrastructure is obviously critical. Being able to have the ability to export it, being able to have the electricity that's needed uh, for those mines that want to be able to, to do everything using electrical, using green options, uh, the transportation, the roads. So yes, there's significant infrastructure that we need to think about as a province to be able to enable these things. But there's something I want to actually look at even further, which is we have all this potential to produce copper. Why are we sending it offshore to be processed? Why are we not looking at the opportunity to be able to have smeltering here and processing of that facility and produce end products in British Columbia? So I actually want to take a serious look at that. Now, there's, there's reasons for that because obviously when you get a, my, a company in Japan that's investing in the mine because it wants the feedstock for its processing in, in Japan, uh, they're not going to be interested in, in that. So there's a number of things that have to be looked at to make it work. But I think, quite frankly, we need to have a serious look at how we build out the secondary capacity so we're not just sending unprocessed material offshore, but we do everything we can to be able to add value to the, to the, you know, to the minerals, to the, to the value, to the, to the resources that we have in British Columbia. You talked about the electricity that's needed, but where are we going to get it from? Uh, Site C is about to come online, and that power uh, surplus is going to get eaten up very quickly. Where do we go from here in uh, power generation to meet our needs, especially as we want to move to a greener uh, fuel economy? Most people don't realize that last year we actually imported about 20% of the electricity we consumed. Pretty shocking number when you think about it. Um, when Site C comes on, it's going to add 10% to our electricity we generate. So if we import the same amount we did last year, it means we're actually going to be still in a deficit. Now, last year, I think, was a bit of a rarity in terms of, you know, because of water levels and these types of things, the electricity we can generate. But even with that, uh, we are going to end up being net importers of electricity before too long. Unless, of course, David Eby gets his, gets his way and gets to carry forward and destroying our economy in British Columbia, in which case maybe we won't need any electricity. But having said that, I, I think we need a plan going forward to make sure that we can meet our needs uh, of electricity in BC. So 84% of the energy we consume today is hydrocarbons. Only 16% is electricity. If we want to be able to have heat pumps, if we want to be able to have electric vehicles, if we want to make sure we electrify our economy, we need significant more electrical generation. We need to have an honest conversation with people in the province in terms of what that means. Where is that power going to come from? Wind and solar can be part of the mix, but they're unreliable. They are not baseload. Run of the river can help in terms of that. You can do things like uh, using wood waste uh, for power, but all of these are not going to get us to where we need to be. If every household and business in the province were to use a heat pump, you would need to build the equivalent of six or seven more Site C dams. And we're likely not going to build another major dam in BC. So where is this power going to come from? So we're actually going to have to have a serious conversation about nuclear power. Let's have that conversation, whether it's small modular reactors or other nuclear technology. Let's talk about what the power is, what it means to our rates, how long it will take to build out, what's the cost associated with that, 
What does that mean in terms of our industry? Let's be honest and straight up with people in this province and make a roadmap for the next 50 years or longer in terms of power generation, electrical generation in this province, what our mix is going to be and how we can actually then transmit that as well because we don't have the grid to be able to do all this additional transmission of power generation. We have to have significant investment in that as well. But public needs to understand what this means as opposed to virtue signaling from a government that just says, oh, we're going to do everything by electricity. It doesn't work that way. You actually have to have the electricity to do these things. And so that plan needs to come first before you can take the other approaches. Sean, we have a question from Sue Pesh. Could you uh, read that question, please? I can, you bet. BC is a vibrant innovation ecosystem, developing products that can be effectively that can effectively address challenges across multiple sectors. Domestic deployment of BC innovations is slow, driving innovators out of the province. How would you address that? You know, that's a, a very good question uh, because there's been so many times I've seen uh, startups that happen in British Columbia, and then there's no capital available for them to be able to expand, so they go to another jurisdiction and we lose that opportunity for, for that innovation and that continual growth. Uh, there's so much in many, many of our sectors already that are tech related in terms of it and their investments. But as a, as a province, we seem to be very ineffective of supporting that kind of growth and supporting the opportunity for investment. And so I look at it from a perspective of how do we change the conditions in this province for people to invest. So many people I know have come up with great ideas that are $100 million companies or you know $2 billion companies, but they cannot make it work in British Columbia, so they go south of the border. And south of the border is very hungry for that business. We seem to just say, oh, it's okay for them to leave here. So we have to change those conditions in British Columbia so that people can invest here. So it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's you know, very general answer to a very specific question, but it is something that we need to be able to do in British Columbia if we want to be able to see the opportunities there. Alec, I saw you checking your computer to make sure that it was working and that I knew that you were there. I know you've got another question. Over to you. Yes, to sort of close out tonight, in terms of the election, you will have to make inroads in Surrey, Langley, the Fraser Valley, these places if you were to form government, a lot of voters in those areas are maybe more fiscally conservative, aren't happy with the massive deficits that the NDP are running up, but are also maybe a bit more socially liberal in terms of their views on social policies. How do you appeal to those voters? Well, the good news, actually, I think we've already done that. Um, in, for example, in Surrey, we are dramatically leading in Surrey. Matter, of, we've, We're competing in all 10 seats in Surrey. Now, long time to go, campaigns matter. We'll see how things change. On Vancouver Island, uh, according to the last Main Street poll that came out, I think a week and a half ago, we're leading on Vancouver Island. Now, people say, how could that be? Well, people are looking for change. When people can't work, when they can't put food on the table, they're interested in change in what we're doing, particularly for those that work in the forestry sector, the blue collar worker that has been ignored by this NDP government. And when you've got very weak leadership from somebody like, like David Eby, uh, it's clear to see that people want change. Throughout the valley as well, we're leading strongly all the way through the valley. And so there's lots of places in this province, I think, that are looking for that common sense change. We're going to continue to go out and expand what we're doing and our engagement uh, in all areas of this province. But I think, you know, we've got a very good path to, to win seats uh, in every community around this province and have that opportunity to be able to form government. So... To round out the evening on uh, a really important topic, because if you go to UBCM right now, the mayor's put forward a proposal where they're asking the provincial government to stand up and make our streets uh, safer. Uh, for a myriad of reasons, uh, we have people, especially in downtown Vancouver, who are saying, I don't want to go out at night. Uh, I'm uncomfortable during the day. Uh, where are you at on what will be uh, hopefully effective approaches to giving people the confidence that they're safe in their own city? Nice, simple question to round up the evening. Well, sure. So, you had to warm you up. Yeah. Do we have another question? <laughs> um, there no. might be a follow-up depending just, on what you, how you answer. I'm just, just joking. No. <laughs> so, look, I, I saw a stat just the other day that 60% uh, or that the foot traffic in places like downtown Victoria is down 60%. How do you operate your businesses when that happens? How do you carry on with small business? How do you make sure restaurants be able to stay open? It's, it's concerning, and, and safety is at the core of it. 
so it's important to note that with crime, it's not you know necessarily drugs and addiction. We've got to deal with those issues and mental health side, but there's the criminal side as well. So I'll, t I'll focus on that. If you want to me to go into the addiction side, because obviously that's a significant component of people be feeling safe as well. Yeah, well, that's why it was the last question complicated with... Uh, so maybe I'll just take the time and go through kind of all three of those yeah. things. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when it comes to crime... Um, 20% of the people are committing 80% of the crimes. That's what the police are telling me. And there's no consequences. So people are being more emboldened to do more crimes. My wife was at a gas station a couple of months ago and an individual came up to her and asked for money. And uh, you know she felt really uncomfortable. This person made her feel really uncomfortable. She said no and she kind of watched him. And he, he left, he moved on, he moved into the grocery store and he went to use the washroom into the convenience store, I should say. He came out of the convenience store grabbed the pop and a couple of bags of chips and walked out the door because there's no consequences. Police aren't going to come. There's nothing that the attendant can do. They can't have security guards everywhere. You've got a company like um, Save on Foods that has hired, I think, 345 security guards for its stores because A, it's trying to keep its people safe but B, it's trying to prevent the losses. And it recovered something like $1.7 million worth of losses last year. And that was only a fraction of what walked out the door. There are no consequences for these crimes that are happening in BC. And so this needs to change. So there's a number of things that need to be changed. We need to expand the courts. Uh, we need to clean up sort of some processes in there, expand the number of judges um, and, uh, and sheriffs, that whole side of things. We've got to create a pathway for, for these uh, lesser crimes, I guess you could say to be able to be addressed within the court system within a timely way. Uh, we're actually gonna be pushing hard, uh, not just for bail reform, but also for guaranteed minimum sentencing. Where you have these prolific offenders that are causing all these problems, there needs to be consequences, and we, sh we need to make sure that these people are taken off our streets. When it comes to more serious crimes, and, I, and this, when I hear about uh, these things, I mean, it just tears me apart. When you get somebody who's obviously got mental health issues, uh, who has been committing, uh, you know, this prolific violent offenders, numerous numerous attacks, charges by police, and are just being rotated in and out on the street again, we have to get these people off the street. I mean, the horrendous situation where somebody with mental health and and clearly, you know, a violent history, known to police, goes out and gets a machete and kills somebody and takes somebody else's hand off. I mean. This person needs to be behind bars. This person needs help and he needs to be behind bars. I, I talked to the Dunn family in Surrey where once again a prolific violent offender with weapons history was led out back on the streets and killed their daughter. I mean it's just tragic for any parent to be in a situation where they have to bury their child because of this. So if the criminal system cannot put these people behind bars and get them the help they need, then we will actually look at using the Mental Health Act. If somebody is at risk of harming themselves or others, they can be held and treated until they're no longer a risk. And it's just something we need to do to actually end this cycle of violence and to make sure that our streets can be safer. Now there is the addictions and, uh, and mental health side of it as well. Um, safe supply is not safe. It needs to come to an end in this province. Decriminalization needs to come to an end because we're taking away tools from police to be able to have a civil society. But we need to build out a significant regime of uh, doctor-prescribed treatment to short-term treatment recovery to longer-term recovery for those that need to be able to build out skill sets. We also, quite frankly, have to look at involuntary recovery and compassionate recovery. Because if you, as a parent, had an 11-year-old daughter who was addicted, and that daughter refused to go into treatment. There's nothing you can do as a parent. There's no way that for you to be able to help that child. And I think any parent would want to be able to make sure that child has an opportunity to be able to get off the addiction and to be able to build a future. And so in British Columbia, we're gonna create that option so that people can make sure that when, when those sort of situations are created, you can actually have your child go into treatment into recovery and to be able to live full and productive lives as opposed to you know the tragedy we saw in Abbotsford uh, back just right. not long ago where a 13-year-old 
unfortunately passed away. So there's much more we could talk about on that, but I know that well, I we may I be running keep, out of time. I, well, I wish I could keep you here longer, but I know that there's other people who want your time as well. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us um, and giving us an insight into the complex uh, challenges that anybody who takes on the role of leader in the province will have to deal with. Uh, I wish you uh, great success in your campaign and once again say thank you. Now, th there is a parting gift for you. You get to take home the coveted Conversations Live mug. I love it. That's that's very good. Thank you. <laughs> that's what you were just going to ask. Do I get to keep the mug? Well, I, I was going to ask that, but I actually just wanted to say thank you very much. Thanks for doing this. It gives them a great opportunity for people to, to uh, see the various leaders and talk about the topics. I'm sure when you get to David Eber, you're going to hear a lot more about me uh, since that seems to be his favorite topic. But... That's fine. Everybody's talking about you, John. <laughs> Everybody's talking about you. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You very really much are. You, are, you really are the uh, the topic that is on uh, top of everybody's mind right now. So thank you, and thank you to all of you in in the room here. Thank you to everybody who's joined us online. I want to give one last shout out to Give a Damn and ask you to check them out. Give a Damn Vancouver, uh, and if you can support uh, what they're doing because they're supporting others. We will see you back here on Thursday with Premier David Eby. Good night.